I'm Dwayne Brown tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. Local Iraqis rally in the East County at this hour calling for peace in their homeland. And new court papers tonight are filed in San Diego's illegal donations case. What prosecutors are now saying about the Mexican billionaire at the center of it all. Plus, opponents of the city's minimum wage increase will try to get it repealed by voters on the November ballot, while a counter campaign says you should decline to sign. I'm Peggy Pico with views from both camps. Then, how to find and get help for depression and a personal story about overcoming the disease after suicide attempts. Also tonight, a downtown success story helping teenage mothers stay in school. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Federal prosecutors say they were investigating a Mexican businessman years before he was charged with making illegal campaign donations to San Diego political campaigns. They say the investigations go back as far as 1997. Jose Susamo Azano Matsura was indicted last week in the illegal donations case. Now federal prosecutors say he's been investigated before in connection with drug smuggling and money laundering in the late 90s and three years ago for allegedly making excessive threats against Semper Energy regarding a land case. The court papers also say investigators looked into Azano's financial records about two years ago on suspicion of tax evasion. Azano has only been charged in the illegal donations case. He's set to be arraigned later this week. Texas Governor Rick Perry's been booked on two felony counts of abuse of power. He turned himself in today and says he'll fight the charges with every fiber of his being. A Texas grand jury indicted him last week in connection with his veto of funding for state prosecutors investigating police corruption. Perry's been mulling a run for the White House in 2016. He says the charges are a political ploy. City leaders in Ferguson, Missouri are telling folks to stay home after dark tonight after several days of pros, uh, protesters clashing with law enforcement. The tension follows the police shooting of teenager Michael Brown over a week ago. Highway Patrol Captain Ron Johnson says at least two people were shot last night, 57 people were arrested, and four officers were injured. Police used noisemakers, tear gas, and flash grenades to disperse the crowds. The funeral for 18-year-old Brown will be held on Monday. There is a rally underway in the East County tonight by members of the Iraqi Chaldean community. They're trying to bring attention to the plight of fellow Christians being persecuted in Iraq. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy joins us by phone from the rally. Susan? Hi, Dwayne. Hundreds of Chaldeans and community members have gathered here in El Cajon. They started at St. Michael Chaldean Catholic Church, and they plan to march through the streets one mile to El Cajon City Hall, where they stayed a rally. I'm marching with them now. They're shouting, save Iraqi Christians. Before that, they were saying, save the families, save the children. Many of these people are new to the community. Tens of thousands have resettled here since the start of the Iraq war. They have family members there, and they just want to help their, their homeland. I spoke to Stephen Nisu of the youth minister of St. Peter Chaldean Catholic Diocese. He's one of the organizers of the event. And he says he wants to bring refuge to the people in Iraq who are being slaughtered every day. This event is all about bringing um, awareness to what's happening to the Iraqi Christians. And our goal is to um, spread the message to everyone that, that what's going on is something that is um, inhumane. And um, we have a moral obligation to speak out and to ask our government and the United Nations to continue to help in uh, make, making a difference and then getting them into a safe environment or allowing them to seek uh, asylum to move here or other countries where they feel safe. And back here in El Cajon, hundreds of people are marching down the streets. They're holding signs and banners and crosses, palm branches, chanting, save Iraqi people. And Dwayne, I'll send it back to you. That's KPBS reporter Susan Murphy reporting live tonight at a rally in El Cajon uh, with members of the Iraqi Chaldean community. 
Uh, Peggy Pico continues our coverage of San Diego's debate over raising the city's minimum wage and what happens next. A day after the council vote cleared the way for a minimum wage increase to $11.50 an hour, opponents are set to gather signatures this week to put the issue on the ballot and hope voters will repeal the wage hike. Meanwhile, a campaign to keep it off the ballot is also underway. Here with details are Jason Rowe with the San Diego Small Business Coalition and Mel Katz with Raise Up San Diego. Welcome. Thank you. Now, Mel, who benefits for, uh, from this boost to the uh, minimum wage? Many hardworking San Diegans, 38% of the San Diegans will benefit. It's 172,000 people will get a boost in their pay because of what the majority of the city council passed last month. And sick days as well. Including a way to earn sick days, and that's 280,000 San Diegans will get that also. Now, Jason, you are part of a coalition that's trying to get uh, signatures gathered to get this on the ballot so that it'll be repealed. Why do you think this wage increase will hurt the local economy? Well, for starters, I think it ignores the fact that the state just implemented a 25% uh, increase just a month ago in July. And, you know, our, our debate is not with the value of a minimum wage increase, but the idea that San Diego, an island by itself now, would go 44 percent instead of the 25 percent that the statewide, this disadvantages uh, San Diego businesses. It drives up those costs and it ultimately disadvantages those workers because we're going to have fewer jobs available as businesses contract to uh, deal with this. They'll have to cut hours and they'll have to cut the number of employees. Well, about, about this being an island, though, other cities, including San Jose, have already enacted a, a wage uh, mm -hmm. increase. So, so how would we be different than that because uh, so far from what I've read there's been no evidence of job loss or, or problems with the economy. Well you know people like to compare to other cities and I think that's apples and oranges you know the economies are very different. Uh, San Jose did that before there was the state um, wage increase um, you know, there's a lot of variables. Our, our economy is wildly different than San Jose, and San Jose is the home to the technology sector, which is the fastest growing sector of the U.S. economy. And if minimum wage jobs are increasing, it's to support the growth in high wage jobs uh, and, the, and the jobs that are being created uh, via technology. Well, Mel, let me get your take on this. You're a businessman, and you, you have businesses in, uh, in, in San Diego. So why are you supporting this when most businesses here, it appears, are unified in, against this. When, when you look in San Diegans today and they make minimum wage and make $1,560, after taxes that's $1,250, and then you take away the rent of a one-bedroom apartment, which is 1032 they have $200 to live on. How do you live in San Diego on $200 for food and transportation, putting gas in your car or even public transportation? And our whole thing is don't sign it. And meaning don't sign the petition because there's no reason to wait 19 months to enact this. Every poll we've seen, including the ones we've done, show that two thirds of San Diegans are in favor of the earned sick days and the minimum wage. Why? have people in San Diego suffer any longer. Let me ask Jason about that. There needs to be 34,000 valid signatures in the next 30 days to get mm. this on the ballot. How optimistic that you think it will get on the ballot and do you think voters will support the repeal? Well, yeah, I mean, there was a local media poll that came out about a week ago in which 60% of San Diego voters said that they believe this should have been done by referendum rather than um, by ordinance. And in fact, Todd Gloria, who is now joining Mel and telling people not to sign it, was quite emphatic about how important it is that San Diegans vote on this. And so I'd say the first part of our challenge here, and we are optimistic we can get it done, is give San Diegans the opportunity to vote on it. Um, it, it you know, we don't govern by polls. We should govern by the voters' will. And I think when voters are not in the vacuum that they are in a poll about, you know, how they feel about a minimum wage and they understand the inflationary uh, impact on them as consumers, the cuts to services that could result in um, uh, for city residents, right. and the loss in jobs, I think they will look at it much differently. And we, well, think, let me, and, and we think that once we educate the public that this could go into effect this coming January, there's no reason to wait 19 months, and we will give immediate relief 
to 172,000 San Diegans to put food on their table, a roof over their head, and transportation. Let me touch on this, though. You're, you have a counter campaign, a uh, decline to sign, as it's called. Um, what are you going to do with that to, to counter this campaign? Strictly an education campaign. We are going to let the public know just what I just said, that this can be, go into effect this January. It's a gradual increase. It only goes to 975 and we don't have to wait 19 months. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. There's a lot more information about this on our website, kpbs.org. Jason Rowe, Mel Katz, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. A bill to promote drought-tolerant landscaping in California is headed to the governor's desk. San Diego Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez is sponsor of the measure. She wants to ban homeowners associations from fining people who replace their lawns to save water. Governor Brown has until the end of September to sign it. Brown's agreed to face his Republican rival for governor for just one debate. It's scheduled for September 4th in Sacramento. Neil Kashkari wanted 10 debates, and his campaign says they'll still, they're still hopeful for more. Brown has a big lead over Kashkari in the polls and campaign funding. Uber is stepping up its game to get accepted across the country. The ride-sharing company we told you about last night hired an advisor who helped get President Obama elected. Uber's facing resistance from taxi companies who say the service gets a break from rules cabs have to follow. The Metropolitan Transit System says a record number of people hopped on buses and trolleys last year. MTS measured its ridership from July 1, 2013 to June 30th of this year. There were more than 95 million passenger trips. Fewer people were taking the bus, but there was a jump in trolley riders, about 10 million more trips than the year before. Most trolley riders were taking the blue line running between Old Town and the border. The Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute has a new chief operating officer tonight. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson says the San Diego Institute is looking to balance its research with the push to bring products to market. The Torrey Pines Research Institute reached out to the pharmaceutical industry to find its next CEO. Dr. Perry Neeson was vice president of science and innovation. Before that, he was a professor of neuro-oncology at the University of Texas Southwest Medical Center. Neeson's challenge is to balance two competing interests, the push for basic research and the desire to bring therapies to market. Bringing those together, I think, will be formidable. And the opportunity and challenge is to establish further the partnerships and connections with pharma. I've lived on that side of the world for quite a period with other entities and organizations collaboratively. The biomedical research organization has struggled with declining funding from the National Institutes of Health. However, in January, Sanford Burnham landed a $275 million grant. It called for the organization to focus on turning basic research into medical tools. Interim CEO Christina Vauri says the institute isn't new to change in its nearly 40-year history. We have expanded our research mission from focusing only on cancer to other areas of unmet medical needs. Uh, today, we do research on diseases of brain, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, diseases of the immune system, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Researchers there also study diabetes, obesity, infectious, and childhood diseases. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. A San Diego company has gotten federal approval for clinical tests of a diabetes treatment based on stem cells. Viasite says it has the potential to be a virtual cure for type 1 diabetes, also known as juvenile diabetes. The treatment is based on human embryonic stem cells. We use a series of chemicals to change these stem cells, and ultimately the, the cells transform into cell types of the pancreas. These cells of the pancreas are then delivered to patients inside of a capsule. Viasite says the cells have worked in animal trials. They plan to enroll 40 patients for human testing. Discussions about depression continue in the wake of comedian Robin Williams' death. Peggy Pico takes a look at treating depression. 
Depression affects nearly 1 in 15 Americans, but finding help and the right treatment can be confusing. Joining me with a few options are my guest psychiatrist, Dr. Stephen Ornish, professor at UC San Diego's Department of Psychiatry, and Graham Cohen, author of the book, Back from the Brink, his personal story of battling five years of severe depression and several attempted suicides. Welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Ornish, what are some of the signs and symptoms of depression and how are patients mm -hmm. diagnosed? Well, the most common sign is really a sad or depressed mood. And when you talk about depression, in terms of uh, talking about a major depression as opposed to the normal sadness that we can all experience day to day. And the most common symptoms are a s sad, highly depressed, sometimes irritable mood. It can present with anger, uh, changes in sleep, changes in appetite, low energy, changes in concentration. Uh, feeling either very run down or feeling very agitated, and suicidal thoughts or feelings. Those are all the hallmarks of a textbook major depression. And we'll come back to how it gets diagnosed because I have another question about that. But Graham, your book recounts your five-year uh, journey, I should say, with severe depression and several suicide attempts. How debilitating was this uh, depression for you? Incredibly debilitating. I couldn't sleep. I had low energy levels. Just dark, dark thoughts. Um, my mind worked more slowly. In a very short time, I lost my job, a 20 year marriage. So, pretty debilitating. Your book also begins with a suicide note from one of your attempts. Did your family and friends uh, know the condition you were in, know that this was a depression? The first suicide attempt, they didn't know because I felt so ashamed. I kept it mis to myself. I didn't reach out and that was a huge mistake. The second time was when, when I wrote that note, it was after really prolonged depression. They did know, but they didn't know that I was going to, to make that attempt. Dr. Ornish, I understand the first point of contact for many patients is their primary care physician. What should a, a primary care physician do if they suspect someone it has depression? Well, primary care physicians are commonly on the front line. That would include uh, family physicians, internists, gynecologists, and pediatricians. And the first step is really to make an appropriate diagnosis, make certain there's no medical cause of the depression, such as low thyroid or even Parkinson's disease, as we saw with Robin Williams, and then to initiate antidepressants for the more moderate to severe depressions, and to make a referral to a psychologist, to a psychiatrist, to a mental health professional, for psychotherapy. Do uh, most patients need a, a referral to come see you? And, and if they think they do, to see a psychiatrist, I should say, um, should they ask their doctor for one? Well, I think patients need to be proactive. So if the primary care physician is not making the referral, ask to be referred to a psychiatrist. Psychiatrists are the most well-trained, qualified mental health specialty to treat major depression, particularly the more moderate to severe ones. Uh, you can also ask for a referral to other mental health specialists, but the most qualified one to treat a major depression, particularly, again, the severe ones, uh, are psychiatrists. And they can also prescribe medication, which is a, a difference there. Now, Graham, you surveyed over 4,000 people living with a depression or yeah. bipolar disorder. From that survey emerged your top 10 list of, of coping mechanisms or effective ways to deal with depression. Highlight a few of those uh, for us. Well, I think the, the top three are to share it with someone you love or trust. Having that emotional support is paramount and people, the compassion side of things were about five of the top 10. So that's really important to come from support groups as well. The second thing is, of course, to see mental health professionals, but people that have experience in depression. Unfortunately, a lot of primary physicians don't have huge experience, and so getting one that does know this area, and if necessary, seeing a psychiatrist. Exercise, 30 minutes brisk walk is, it was just seen as, 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 as really important for coming back. And so they'd probably be the top three that I'd focus on. In, we'll have to end with this. Dr. Ornish, um, medication obviously is a, a treatment of choice for a lot of, a lot of people with depression. How do you determine who needs medication and what kind of follow-up is needed if somebody, either their family practice doctor or a psychiatrist, gives them an antidepressant? Well, you determine by the nature and extent of the depression. Again, medication we typically reserve for the more moderate to severe depressions. and you determine who needs it by the subjective symptoms that the person is manifesting. For the milder depressions, those can be often treated with psychotherapy 
as well as lifestyle changes uh, to complement it, as Graham had indicated. In terms of follow-up, uh, once medications are prescribed, they typically are very well tolerated. Usually the physician or the psychiatrist will see the patient and follow up within a week or two, and then subsequently will stretch out the sessions depending on the response. All right. Well, we have to end it there. There's a lot more resources on our website, kpbs.org. Stephen Ornish, uh, Dr. Stephen Ornish and author Graham Cohen, thank you very much. I want to let folks know that if you or someone you know is suffering with untreated depression or is suicidal, you can call help and you can get help around the clock by calling the San Diego County Crisis Hotline, 888 888- 724-7240. That's 888-724-7240. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. How the Indonesian city of Banda Aceh has turned to Sharia law after a devastating tsunami. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. Teen mothers have a tough time staying in school while taking care of their babies. The Lindsay School, run by San Diego's Office of Education, is celebrating 20 years of helping teen mothers uh, graduate. KPBS education reporter Matt Bowler says this year it's also giving their babies an educational boost. I want to be a lawyer, so I'm going to major in psychology. Normal dreams from two soon-to-be high school graduates. There's not a specific major for counseling, so I'm going through psychology. Because I like defending people and I don't like injustices. Itzel and Ashley are both students at Lindsay School. They both want to go to college, they both want to help people, and they both light up when they talk about their babies. She's nine months. <laughs> yeah, he's a handful. When teenagers have children all too often, the first thing they do is drop out of school. A 2013 report from the San Diego County Health and Human Services Agency says half of teen parents do not graduate from high school. And the children of teenage mothers are at a higher risk for all kinds of problems, from abuse and neglect to developmental delays. The young mothers themselves often come from abusive homes. A lot of them are pushed to to the brink of of, um, what humans might do just to take care of a child. Don Miller teaches almost everything apart from math and science. I think if you heard any of the stories of any of these girls, you would be surprised that they're sitting in their desks acting kind of like normal teenage students. Um, So the amount of of resiliency and bravery that they exhibit is to me like a daily inspiration. These young women found or were found by San Diego County's unique Lindsay School. Lindsay School is a small three-room high school in downtown San Diego totally devoted to helping teenage mothers. The school began to offer classes and daycare for its young mothers and children 20 years ago. Everybody's in the same building, and if need be, the babies can be in class with the mothers. Miller's seen hundreds of young mothers come through Lindsay in her 15 years at the school. What's remained is that it's still woman-centered, um, caring for the girls in the community in a certain way. Pregnancy rates among teens have gone from 25 per thousand to 15 per thousand over the past decade. But Miller says the need for Lindsay School is growing. We have seen a a boom, although the rates of of teen pregnancy have leveled off, there is a growth uh, in our population um, because the needs and the resources that the girls need are not being met at the traditional school. This year, Lindsay School met their needs. All its graduates are continuing on to higher education. This semester, we have 100% um, entrance into college. Some of those are part-time students. They're not all full-time, but um, they're all going mostly to city and some of the other community colleges. And for the babies, it's been an evolution, too. When Lindsay first opened, and for the last 20 years, they offered daycare. That's a huge help for mothers, but it's essentially babysitting. This year, the school is partnering with the 100-year-old San Diego charity, Neighborhood House, and offering preschool for the children. Carissa May from Neighborhood House runs the new preschool. We do um, offer a creative curriculum-based program. We have different assessment tools we use on the children. Now, not only is mom in school, but so is her child. Jose Villarreal, the director of Lindsay School, explains why the partnership with Neighborhood House is so important. Uh, how do we sort of elevate that, that ability for our, our little ones to stop the cycle of poverty, the cycle of violence? Because most of our girls are dealing with those two big topics. And so for us, the partnership with Neighborhood House was ideal. The young mothers say they get the help and understanding they need here. Well, they've helped me out a lot here because I was two years behind on my high school and I actually ended up making everything up in a year. Never judge. They just 
They're like, okay, this is your situation. How are we going to get to the next hub? For Ashley and Itzel, the next step is San Diego City College. Miller has a different dream. The dream is, is that we wouldn't even need a special school, right? That, that pregnant teen moms would be supported mm -hmm. wherever their home school is, right? This school, although it's a very beautiful place, um, you know, shouldn't exist. That's not the reality. That's not the reality. The reality of being a teenage mother isn't always in line with the reality of getting an education for both mother and child. But the young women at Lindsay School are making it work. Matt Bowler, KPBS News. We've got a chance of some isolated thunderstorms in parts of the county, mid to upper 70s over the next few days along the coast, mostly cloudy conditions. A mix of uh, clouds and sun for the inland valley, slightly warmer, temperatures in the mid 80s. As for the mountain areas, thunderstorms possible through Thursday, temperatures in the upper 70s, and in the desert, sunshine after tomorrow with uh, daytime highs near 100 degrees. Let's recap our top stories tonight. Members of the East County's large Iraqi Chaldean community are rallying at this hour trying to bring attention to the plight of Christians in Iraq. They say Iraqi Christians are targeted by Islamic militants. And federal prosecutors say they were investigating a Mexican businessman years before he was charged with making illegal donations to San Diego political campaigns. The name Jose Susamo Azano Matsura came up in cases from the late 90s. Investigators are looking into uh, drug smuggling, money laundering, and tax evasion. No charges, however, were ever filed in those investigations. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash Evening Edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.